Dr. Lindemann is a professor emerita in philosophy and a senior scholar at the Institute of Aging and Policy at Mount St. Mary College. She earned her BA in English from Seton Hall University, uh, her MA in philosophy from Fordham University, and received her doctorate from Michigan State University. Um, Dr. Lindemann is a member of the American Philosophical Association, the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and the Society for Women in Philosophy. With Sister Mary Christine Morkowski, she introduced Latin American philosophy of liberation into the United States. <coughs> Dr. Lindemann has contributed articles about Stephen Tolman, teaching philosophy, disability theory, philosophy of liberation, feminist theory, and women philosophers to various philosophy journals. And she has authored chapters for several philosophical texts. Her website, womenphilosophers.com, was recognized by UNESCO, and the organization has sponsored her attendance at the Third Assembly of the International Network of Women Philosophers in 2011 in Paris. As Professor Emerita, she continues research and writing and has introduced the topic of elderhood into philosophical discourse. Okay, so now uh, just a little introduction to your your talk here. Um, for so long we have described Western philosophy as originating with Greek and Roman thought, but just as modern Western science and mathematics owes much to Arabic thought, so too does Western philosophy. Recent scholarship is demonstrating that Greek thought, especially in philosophy, has Arabic roots. This is important for a recent study of Arabs in the Middle East showed that one of their main dissatisfactions with people in the West is our lack of understanding and or respect for their accomplishments. But if we acknowledge the worth of women, we will find Arabic roots to the philosophy that is fun foundational in Western thought. Thank you, John. Sure. I want to start off with three thank yous. First, to the Kirk Memorial Library and staff, without whom I would not be able to do most of the research that I do. I mean, they get books from all over for me. Uh, second to John Hauffauer and the philosophy department, there are not many division chairs in philosophy departments in the United States who even care about women philosophers. So, acknowledgement there. Um, and, uh, IT also, who, who have really been helpful. I have thought a good deal. Uh, can you hear me this way? Yes. If you're okay. okay. Because I like to move around. Good. Um, I've thought a good deal about how to do this, and I, because there's so much information. And what I've decided to do is to tell three stories. Okay. The first story outlined here is well known to almost anybody who has taken a philosophy course in the United States, Canada, or Europe, or in the university system in Latin America. And that is Thales is the first philosopher. Thales of Miletus. He uh, also did astronomy. He predicted eclipses. But his basic question was, what are all things made out of? And he said, water. Uh, many contemporary environmentalists would be very pleased with him <laughs> over that. Uh, Anaximenes, I'm sorry, Anaximander had a different notion. He said it, it was the unlimited, this infinite, that all things then come out of and come into being. Pythagoras is perhaps one of the most important people in this list. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Many of us know him for the Pythagorean theorem. Um, but he, he spawned a whole school of philosophy um, very much into uh, ratios, music, the well-tempered life, and so on and so forth. 
Anaximenes went is back to the issue of which all things are formed, and for him it is air. And then two of my favorites. When I was an undergraduate, I loved these two. Actually, I did a, um, a master's paper on Heraclitus. He was able to, able to do, because we have lots of his fragments. And he, he really, he, he didn't think much of human beings. I mean, he, he basically did not think well of us. But for him, he said, change is central. Everything is always changing. There is no one thing. And the famous statement everybody always quotes is you can't step into the same river twice because by the time you take your foot out and put it back in, the waters have changed and it's a new river. Parmenides stands at the opposite. Parmenides says, those of us who think of it, that there is change, change is illusion. Being is, and it cannot not be. Being is, and it cannot not be. So all things are being, do you see? And so the apparent, apparent changes. Being is, and it cannot not be. When I was an undergraduate, you know, I, I went to Hunter and you took the bus and I was working 30 hours a week and things really were could be chaotic, and I knew nothing about mantra meditation at the time, but I used to repeat to myself, being is, and it cannot <laughs> not be. It really was a mantra, and it sustained me, and I will be honest with you, there are days in the last two years that I have gone back to, being <laughs> is, and it cannot <laughs> not be. So these are two really, they're like opposite poles, opposite poles. And then, you know, you have, you have some more um, people who are all into uh, what is the basic stuff of things. Then you have the sophists who say, who cares? What counts is learning to get a job and be successful. They weren't into the job, it was politics for them, okay? And then we have Plato and Aristotle, and then we move to Augustine in North Africa, the Greek fathers, and it moves to Europe with Anselm, uh, the university system, Middle Ages, and into modern. This is the story of philosophy that I was taught, is still being taught, it is, <clears throat> there is another story though. The other story is that philosophy did not begin in 600 before the Common Era, but philosophy began 2,000 years before the beginning of the Common Era. In Babylon, which is the area of Iraq, Syria, and Hedwan, N is like a, um, an honorific title that was given to her, was the daughter of Brontius, who was the general who created the Babylonian Empire through his conquest. And he, like so many, you know, when I, when I, when I read the history of philosophy, one of the most wonderful things that could have happened to a woman was to be the eldest daughter of a man who didn't have a son. They, because they poured all their energies into the education and getting people to acknowledge his daughter. And here she is. Now when I first found her, she was on her town's website. Since then she's disappeared. Okay, and I have no idea what that's all about. She's not there. But what has happened is that there are a lot of people who have gotten interested in her work. And like some of the later philosophers, she did her work uh, particularly through hymns, poetry. And for her, it is the sun that is the source of all things. And we have these hymns to the sun.
son, I mean, if you were interested, <coughs> you can, I guess we can't do it here, to, uh, I think do something like this. Well, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, you can go to the, the website, there's, there's a bit about her. I don't have all her, her written work there, part, partly because I didn't want to go through the problem of getting permission of all these people to put it on my website, so instead I put some links. You know, um, I, I feel strongly about that. And then in Egypt, we are sometime later, this again is before the common era, there's Agonies, who is known, particularly in mathematics, you know, if you do the history of mathematics, she shows up. She also, you know, like Thales, was able to predict the eclipses and so on and so forth. One of the things that fascinates me is Egypt. I've always, because, you know, when you think of the role of women in Egypt, they had those queens, mm -hmm. the pharaohs, this scholar, Later, with Alexandria, I really want to go to Alexandria someday. Perhaps just by disguise myself so, so I don't look like an American. <laughs> but later, in the early Christian period, the, the Hypatia was the, the, the most well-known philosopher. And she was in Alexandria. And she had taught one of the Christian bishops but she was so powerful and she really argued for the ancient um, approaches rather than the Christian approaches. I mean, that's who she was. And what happened was that a group of Christian philosophers interested her in coming into the cathedral or the big church and she did, and when she got before the altar, they took out their knives and hacked her to death. She became, as a result of that, if you, if you look and find the Journal of Feminist Philosophy, it's called Hypatia, okay? And they chose her. There is a movie, if you go to YouTube, there's a movie on Hypatia. I don't think it's a very good movie, but it's there. <laughs> She's becoming a cause celeb. But she's much later, okay? I'm just coming out of Egypt. I, I jump around a lot, okay? I'm a jump around thinker. Okay, so we've talked about agonies. Now, these four women are over here because they're from India, okay? Lopamadua, Garji, Matia, and Babali. And one of them, we do have a uh, rather long text, and she uses a method of questioning. And she questions and questions and questions and questions, getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until there is no question left, <laughs> okay? And when I read that, I said, you mean I've read her work and I was thinking, what is there? You know, Socrates used questions. There is an academic dean in India who, when she saw my website and had gotten some of the newsletters, emailed me and she said, can you, can you get someone to come to India to teach my teachers? Oh, okay. And I um, have never answered her since a trip to India is certainly outside my <laughs> economic. But I mentioned these, you know, you wind up saying they're sort of isolated. They're sort of isolated, but they become important. They become important, and here is the woman, Theano, from Crotona, Italy. I want to go to Italy. Now they tell me that Crotona is an industrial city and she wants to go there. But the story, the story is Pythagoras, where is it? Here he is. We know that Pythagoras spent time in Egypt. He also spent time 
in Babylon. So he may have touched on some of her work. She's not alive then, okay? But, but the, the, the theory goes on, just like we talk about Socrates. And it is said that he went to the Orient. Now, if he went to the Orient, it was probably not China. Recent research has shown that the uh, civilization of Crete was enormous, they, they, the maritime work, <coughs> they, they found one of their boats in the mud in England. When you think of people coming from Crete, which is over near Greece, and with human propelled and sail, navigate to England, up the coast, of Europe, certainly to Italy, and they also went to India and had founded some towns. So when we talk about Pythagoras <laughs> going to the east, to the Orient, it was probably India. And so this tradition would have been there. It was very much, and they were caught very much also in the religious tradition. That's why I say it would have still probably been allowed. Life. Do I have the documents to show that? No. But we don't have many documents on these folks either. Uh, but Teano, when Pythagoras, who had been in Egypt, okay, takes the ship back to Italy, Word went forth that Pythagoras was coming, and he la lands in Crotona. Theano is a young, brilliant mathematician. He is not young anymore, okay? But she hears that he's coming, and she runs down the hill to meet his ship. A year or so later, they marry. And she, whoops, like many mathematicians, is involved in, in the philosophy. They have five children, three girls, two boys. The three girls, Damo, Arignote, and Mia, are Pythagorean philosophers. In fact, it is Damo who is the youngest that before Pythagoras dies, he gives her his manuscript for his fourth book and says, bring it to Athens, which he does. You see, it's this great mystery. When I learned this, everybody, nobody, you know, how did Pythagoras' theories get into the Greek philosophy and so on and so forth? Well, it's interesting, we know. Dama brought them. Dama brought them. See, I find that exciting. Yeah. I really do, because it's, it's a very different history. And so then the next question is, how come this is the history that has been taught for five or six hundred years in every philosophy? And that is my third story. Up until the Middle Ages, if you got an education, an education was open to women as much as men. Now, not many people had education during the Middle Ages. But among the landed class, I guess we'd say the aristocracy, there was the tutorial system and parents had their daughters tutored by the same tutors as tutored the boys, the sons. Okay. The second way of getting an education was to go to a monastery. We know, for example, that St. Anselm visited all the monasteries <coughs> to find out who had the best teacher before he decided what monastery he went to. 
so much for just holiness, right? <laughs> <laughs> he was a scholar. Okay. He also was a saint. And in the Middle Ages, and up through the Middle Ages, there are women monasteries which are scholarly. Remarkably scholarly monasteries. In fact, in one of them, one of the younger sisters wrote plays. Now this was up near Germany. Okay. And so she wrote plays in Germany. She's the first German dramatist. What I found interesting is that she wrote plays with Christian people in them in the style of Terence. Now, I don't know how many of you took fourth year Latin, but Terence, at best, is 40. He'd be rated R. <laughs> so she had read Terence. She knew him well enough to be able to imitate. Okay, so you know, we sometimes have all these myths or these ideas about what things were going on. Now, one of the <coughs> most well, okay, so we gotta jump to the 13th century. The 13th century, the Bishop of Paris decides to fund a university, and since it's basically for the education of his clergy, he says it will be for men only. Up in the north, northern Germany, is Hildegard. Hildegard van Bingen, who is the, I want to say prioress, but I come out of the Dominican tradition. Come on, somebody, give, she's the abbess yeah. <laughs> of a monastery. She is the most well-known scholar of her day. She does science. You probably have heard her music because there are several people who have played the Heather on the Breath of God. It's all a cappella singing. She did herbology, early biology, medicine. She, was a, she did theology. Okay, her work was read out loud by a pope at a synod in Rome. Okay, we got this going on, I thought. <laughs> she was also a public, major political figure. Now you have to understand that monasteries had land around them. And whoever the abbot or abbess was, was responsible for everyone. And they had enormous power. You mean, I, I compare them to Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> because some, some of them had armies. There's some that coined their own uh, currency. This was a powerful position. She hears that the Bishop of Paris is starting university and that it's to be for men only. She sends it, she, she's really taken aback. She sends him copies of all her books with a letter that says, if you do this in a couple hundred years, there will not be such women scholars. He ignored her, he did it. And those of you who know the history of the university system in Europe, you know that it was closed to women up until Germany in, what was the 1800s? I'm not sure, some women went over, they founded a vassal, you know, this, this was a whole other movement. Women scholars continue, <coughs> they continue, but, what happens is we tend to be interested in the issues faced by people like us. And so you have a university system of all men. And the story of women's place in all the subjects just dies. Just dies. But it's natural. I recall Karen McCarthy, who I owe so much to. 
she translated a paper I was working with Mary Christine Makovsky because I was saying that Latin American philosophy of liberation had much in common with North American feminist philosophy at the time. And we co-wrote a paper, and we were going down to Bogota. My Spanish, so I got, I asked Karen if she would translate the paper and read it into a tape for me, which she did. And the night before I left, she said to me, Kate, you are either very brave or you are loco. <laughs> Well, I got down there, and you know, all, I, you know, I, I tried, and when people saw I tried, suddenly they were speaking English. It was quite nice. Not Ooh. everybody. <laughs> Several from Argentina didn't know any. We, we, here we are trying to communicate, because she, she wanted to be in touch with these North American feminists. But on the first day, I was very impressed. Women are on the platform with all the men. I mean, they, I, I came with all these uh, myths about Latin America. And a woman from Chile gave a paper on pre-conquest philosophers <coughs> in Chile. <coughs> pre-conquest philosophers in Chile. Certainly never talked about the university system any more than we talk about the philosophers, the wise women, especially in the Navajo tradition, in this country. Now, I'm jumping around. I hope you can put up with that. How did we even begin to know about this? Turns out, because there was a Canadian philosopher, Beatrice Zango, spoke about six languages, was in France, and came across a book by Gilles Menager on the history of women philosophers that begins with the Platonists, the earliest women, and goes straight on up. Here he was, 16th century. She found the manuscript. She translated into English. It was published by Catholic University Press. I was in the philosophy department. I always read all those brochures. I saw it in a brochure, ordered it for the library. They have very kindly rebound it. Okay. And that was my first introduction to this history. But I wasn't the only one, nor the big one. There's a woman, she's at the University of Dayton now. Her name is Mary Ellen Waite. She read the same book and said, this is important stuff. But she thought much bigger than I ever thought of. She came from the university system. <laughs> and she put a notice out on the Society for Women in Philosophy discussion list and said, I want to edit the history of women philosophers. Anybody who knows anything about a woman philosopher who would be willing to write a chapter, would you contact me? Would you give me the names of others? So I was able to tell Mary Christine Makovsky, who could do Sor Juana de la Cruz, the Mexican. Um, you know, so pe people did this back and forth. She found people who read Greek and Latin and what have you. And this four volumes came out of it. At Mount St. Mary College, we always had the tradition of being able to offer topics. You taught enough of this stuff long enough and you could offer it. So I wanted to teach topics course in history of philosophy, women philosophers. And it was interesting. Uh, a number of people took it. And it was very interesting. Many of the mostly women who took that went on to be made a minors. But the problem was, every one of these cost about $149. The library had copies. I asked them to buy and share a copy. 
But I kept thinking, who can afford this? Who can afford this who might know of other women philosophers? Not many women in the Native American community. Not many of the women in Latin America. Not many of the women. And so I thought, we've got to find a cheaper way to do it. And that's how I started this History of Women Philosophers website. Now, what ha what's happened in the result of that is that I have gotten word from people around the world who have told me of philosophers out of their tradition. Mm -hmm. A young student, she wasn't so young. I think anybody who's a student must be young. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But she told me, um, <coughs> she was attending the University of Jerusalem, and she sent me the name of several Jewish women philosophers who I never heard of. Never heard of them. I began researching, and there they were. I found, actually on my own, a woman from Kazakhstan. What's interesting is the people, Russian people from the Russian Federation are the most frequent readers of this website. So they must have English. I was put on to some women in China. And so there's this entire history out there that we didn't know about. While the university system was closed to women, and the university system today, you know, when I went to UNESCO, they teach the European style in North Africa. And I am saying, you must have philosophers. It's like I've been trying for two years to find someone who would give me information about some of the Native Americans. You mean, philosophy means to love wisdom. That's its meaning. So, anyhow, I'm currently not. I hope this goes on. There is, okay. Now, my third piece. I finished three stories, okay? I want to now do a little piece of analysis, which I was kind of getting into. One of the most central things we all need to remember is whoever is not at the table in the academic world will not be studied. <laughs> is this important? I have just come to realize, this, this was a, an insight as I prepared for this. I have studied American history in grade school high school, I took a New York State Regents in it, college. But the history I studied began with the Europeans mm -hmm. who came to this country. And in the last two years, I've been reading the history before that. There's 2,000 years of history. But you see, the Native Americans weren't in the history department. Just like in the 13th century, when women were out of the philosophy department. So it, it becomes, to me, it's very important that we have and hire people who are different from us. Because, and this is, this is I, you know, the analysis, why doesn't it happen? Because when I am interviewing, I tend to think that the people who are like me are the most qualified. I saw this, I saw this, uh, you know, there was a time the philosophy and religious department, studies department at Mount St. Mary College was all women, all Roman Catholic sisters. And I remember the chair saying, we have to hire someone in religious studies who is not Catholic. Well, it was very interesting. We didn't 
really come across as the most qualified. And I realize now it's because he was different. He was different. And this, this I think is a, is, is a terribly important thing that ourselves. I remember after the Vietnam War, I, I was teaching in the night program we had courses at Rancourt. I was teaching intro at night. And there were five or six young men from uh, the city of Newburgh. They were veterans. And they were back. And one day, they weren't doing that well on the course. And one day, one of them said, you know, one of the problems is that you test out of our weakest strength. All the tests are written. I come from an oral culture. We never get a chance to show our strength. Actually, it was after that that I began introducing orals <coughs> as a testing method, one of the testing methods in all my courses. It, I was so grateful that he said that to me. because I assumed that we had to do it like me. <laughs> because that's the way I had been trained. Are you with me? Yes. yes. So one of, one of the things, you know, and here I'm, I'm going off on this, I mean, it's not just about women in the history of philosophy, but it's who sits at the table. That's a central issue. When we come to academia, because what we can see or not see. And I see Larry Force there. I wanted to start off saying I also, besides the uh, library and the philosophy department, I want to acknowledge the center, Larry and the Center on Aging and Policy because it is really his encouragement and creating a place at the table for me that's enabled me to continue on and believe that I could continue to do scholarship after I retired. You're so young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But 